I'm assuming you've already either watched the quick start or had a few minutes to play around with Shape Monkey. If not, just go back and watch that before you watch this. We'll break it down and go through everything, but before we get into it, I want to get you acquainted with some of the basic concepts that we use throughout the UI. Many of the controls of the UI are based around a drop-down, minimum, and maximum combination. If you understand these, you're most of the way there. The drop-downs will always define the nature of the action of that section. The minimum and maximum define the strength of that action. This combination comes in two variations. First is the drop-down number entry box version, and you can find that in duration and opacity. It's up to you to enter what you want the minimum and maximum amounts to be. The second variation is the drop-down slider combination. These can be found in the animation section. In this one, the drop-downs still dictate the action, but the minimum and maximum settings are predefined, and it's up to you to decide the strength by moving the slider. Right is more, left is less. All the drop-downs can be broken into three basic subcategories. In order, they're constant, random, and sequence. Constant means that all copies created by ShapeMonkey will be assigned the exact same setting from that section. If it's not labeled as such, constant is the top section of the dropdown. Random means that each copy will be assigned a different setting. The setting is either based on the min-max values or the position of the slider bar. And lastly, there's sequence. And this means that the layers are assigned a value in order of minimum to maximum. The sequence can be applied from the top layer to the bottom or bottom to top. There's two basic parts to the process, the pre-build, which is controlled by the UI, and the post-build, which are additional controls you have after the build is done. The UI is broken down into five sections. I found that there's no real particular order how to work with these sections. As you get into it, you'll find yourself bouncing around all over the place, but in general, I'll go through them in the order I tend to think of them in. Setup is a place I usually start. The copies will give you the number of shape layers created. I tend to keep this number as low as possible when I'm setting things up. If you can do quick experiments, it'll help speed up the process. Don't be afraid to build and unbuild a whole bunch of times. That's how this is designed to work. The geometry gives you a bunch of preset shapes. We tried to make them as modular as possible, so they work well together. Most of them will be scaled to take up roughly a quarter of the screen. The selected layer option at the top is for shapes that you create yourself. These can also include text layers or vector files. There's no need to convert them to shapes manually. ShapeMonkey will do that for you. All you have to do is select it and ShapeMonkey will use it as its source for the build. Duration. This is the basis for all the timing in your animation. Everything in the UI is looking at this to figure out how long it should be doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. This is the first feature that will use the system I described. Very simply, constant will assign each layer the same number of frames per move. In this case, the default is 30. If you choose random, then the minimum becomes active, and you can change it to whatever. Each shape will be assigned a frame count that will fall somewhere in between the two numbers. Lastly is sequence, and you can pick from the top layer being assigned the minimum amount of time and the bottom of the max, or vice versa. Every layer in between will be assigned an equal amount of time between them. This is great when you want animations to gradually speed up or slow down in pace. Interpolation and ease type are pretty self-explanatory. I won't go through them other than to say that changing these might have really dramatic effects on your project. And I'm not talking about just movement, but the design itself, so make sure to experiment with these. The shape section. This section dictates the look of each shape. The treatment box icons control what will be active on the shapes themselves. You can just click them to turn them on and off. Stroke width and dash control the thickness and the spacing of the outlines. When any shape with a stroke is active, you'll have the option of either a flat or a round setting. This will control both the cap and the miter join. Line variation is a slight twist on our basic system. The modifiers to the action are all in the dropdown. Constant means that each shape will have a line width and dash setting of whatever is defined in the width and dash settings. One of the random options will give you a predefined mix based on the percentage of the width settings. The exact formula we use is in the user manual if you're interested. Sequence will arrange that mix so that the thinnest width will be on the top and the thickest will be on the bottom. Opacity uses the same system as duration, which I explained before, so I won't waste your time. The palette section has a bunch of options to quickly apply color to your shapes. First, you can mix them yourself by clicking the boxes. 
There's a bunch of preset palettes that you can pick from. Just click the P button and they'll pop up. All you have to do is click one and it'll appear in the color boxes. Lastly, there's the .a button, which stands for .ase. Cooler used to allow for downloads, but I think that's changed. But you can hunt around and find these here and there. We'll package them up for you in the downloads folder as well. When you click that button, it'll ask you to navigate to them. I tend to keep them in the sidebar so they're easy to find. There's also an animate palette dropdown, which will cycle the colors over the length of the duration. You can either fade from one color to the next or cut between them. We're going to skip over array for now and get back to that at the end of the tutorial. It kind of rearranges the way ShapeMonkey works, and it's best to have an understanding of the non-array system first. This one took a while to figure out, but here's what we came up with. I'm going to skip over the in and out for a second and just talk about length and linger because they're interconnected. The length of the longest transition possible for a specific layer is the length of the max setting in duration. The length slider will control how long that transition is. If the slider is set all the way to the left, it's going to give you the shortest possible time, basically a cut. If the slider is set all the way to the right, it's going to give you the longest possible time. Linger will dictate not only when the transition out occurs, but will also impact the possible length of the transition. When Linger is active, the animation will finish its move before it starts transitioning out. If Linger is off, that means that the transition out will be completed by the time the move is over. Transition in and out are pretty much identical, but some of them need some explaining. Cut, fade, and off are self-explanatory. Grow and shrink are really not what they seem. They aren't scale effects, though they might appear to be. They're actually a combination of a few different shape effects. One, the offset paths are animating to or from zero. Two, the stroke width is animating to or from zero. And three, a dissolve is applied to the fill. This is why when you shrink or grow a complex shape like text, it'll look like it's expanding or compressing. Simple shapes will look like they're just getting bigger or smaller. Linear and radial right on and off is simply a trim path effect applied to the shape. The only real difference is that one animates the start and the other animates both the start and the end. When either of these are selected, angle controls will be placed in the effects panel of the control layer, which we'll get to later. Write-ons work well with simple shapes with fills or strokes, and radial works really well with just outlines. If you're using wipes with complex shapes and fills, there's a good chance that the wipe will extend beyond the boundaries of the path from time to time. If you want to avoid that, one suggestion would be to try using the original shape as an alpha mask, if the design allows for it. The animation section is built for speed and creating fast iterations. This section is made up of two matching sets of scale, position, and rotation. Think of these as the start and end keyframes. There's a few basic setups that come into play. One, if nothing is active in either set, the copies will all have the same settings as the original shape. Two, if only one set is active, the copies will be affected, but they will not animate. It's like setting one keyframe. Three, if both sets are active, the copies will animate between them using the duration and interpolation settings in the UI. Four, if one of the sliders is set to zero, then the shape will animate to or from the original setting, depending on if the slider is at the start or the end of the animation. Animation can be created by using any combination of these scenarios. I'll take you through a few quick examples. I'll create my own shape, and I'll click Selected Layer in Geometry. I make a few changes to the UI. Let's say I want a bunch of these to fly in and settle at about half the size as the original. So, We'll set the start scale to increase and set the slider to pretty high and the end scale to decrease with the slider pretty low. And when I click do it, the shape starts bigger and ends smaller. Okay, we'll undo that and I'll change it up so it ends the same size as the original at a clockwise rotation at the beginning and a bigger clockwise rotation at the end and build that. And we get this. Now we'll undo that, and this time, start position to sequence left and leave end position off. Change the fill, and maybe change the start scale to decrease with an extreme slider. Build that. 
you can get the idea how quickly you can start bouncing around and creating really quick animations very easily. And when you have something alike, you might want to then add some copies, play with the timing, the interpolation, or whatever. The preset section will give you a choice of dozens of setups for your UI and effects controls. Once you select one of these, your UI will change. You can adjust the settings manually before the build, like changing the number of copies, the geometry of the palettes. You won't see any changes if you select a preset effect, since that will be applied after the build. There's a link to a gallery of the presets in the info box. For those of you familiar with Marker Sync from our other scripts, you'll know what this is, but it works a little differently than the others. Marker Sync is a way to align markers generated in the building process with a pre-existing marker layer. This is a great way to trigger shapes to music. Once you have one of these marker layers created, all you have to do is select it and click Sync. You can't sync it during the build, only after the build is done. You can't have more Shape Monkey markers than Sync markers, or it'll give you a warning. If you have multiple Shape Monkey control layers, the Sync layer must have at least as much as the layer with the highest number of markers. All markers will align to the beginning of the sync layer. If you want to exclude control layers from a sync, you can lock them. Okay, let's move on over to the post build section. After you build, your timeline will look something like this. The Peach Shape Monkey control layer will have a bunch of markers on it, one for each shape created. You can slide the markers around to adjust the timing. When you unshy a comp, you'll see all the shape layers there. Each shape is parented to its control layer, so you can move that layer around, rotate it, or resize it. You can also select specific shapes and transform them manually as well. If you have a few builds in the same comp, it'll look like this. All the control layers will be gray, but the last one will be peach. That's the master and all the other control layers will be parented to it. When you click on each control layer and go to the effects panel, you'll see the post build controls. These are pseudo effects that introduce a whole new way to control each shape. These effects are live and unlike the UI, there's no need to rebuild to make changes. The first part is transforms. This controls the size of each shape, the skew, and the rotation. These can be keyframed as you would any normal effect. If you use a transition right on or off, you'll find a set of angle controls here as well. Next up are turbulence controls. This introduces an organic element to the motion. You have amount and speed controls for scale, position, and rotation. The amount can be keyframed, but the speed can't. Lastly, there's drift, and this sets a global scale, position, or rotation change that takes place over the duration of the comp. There's also a delay that can be selected. Okay, back to the array section. Now that you have an idea about how the whole thing works, Forget everything you think you knew. Well, not, not really. Radial Array will create a circular design based on the selection in the geometry dropdown. The total number of arrays is still controlled by the copies, but the number of the shapes in the array is controlled by the number entry box next to it. The array itself will act as any shape layer would normally act, so the transform, interpolation, timing, etc. will all apply, but there are a few differences. If you choose Explode or Implode, there's a second animation that's going to go on. The shapes themselves are moving and the interpolation controls that movement. Also, transitions apply to the individual copies within the array, not the entire array itself. Lastly, in the effects controls, those now apply to the individual shapes as well in the array. So that's it. If you've made it this far, congratulations. Some words of advice about Shape Monkey. I found that most of this is pretty easy to anticipate and with a bit of practice you'll learn how to control it, but other times it's going to surprise you. My advice, use random settings wisely and embrace the unpredictability. That's part of the beauty of this monkey. Please send us some samples so we can post them up and we'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas. On behalf of Dan Eberts, I'm Oren Zucker, thanks for watching and we hope you enjoy your new monkey.